Hi, everyone. This is Jason Birak of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. He is precious metal expert, and he also has a great YouTube channel uh, about the global economy and also precious metals, The Wealth Watchman. Thank you for joining me again. Thank you. It's my pleasure and my honor, Jason. Thanks. Now, Watchman, you did a video recently about Brexit. Uh, do you think it is good for freedom and precious metals that uh, the Brexit vote was in favor of leaving? I, I do. I think uh, I, I think it will do several things. I think it is going to, on an individual and uh, you know communal level of liberty. I think what it's helping to do is to spark hope, to ignite the fire, uh, the inspiration that ordinary people can actually make a difference uh, for their people, their countries, and their communities again. For, for, for decades, uh, not just the peoples of Britain, but the peoples all over Europe, the peoples all over America, uh, the peoples all over the West, and, and, and even in, 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 the, in, in the East as well, have they've felt besieged in their own countries, in their, in their own communities by this never-ending, uh, you know, ever-encroaching globalism that seems to, uh, to want to destroy markets, to, to destroy identity, to destroy countries, to destroy freedom, uh, to sell a lot of bombs, a lot of arms, and start a lot of wars, uh, but not really care about our jobs, uh, our wealth, our security, uh, and our futures. And I think that this Brexit success uh, has shown that the people actually – when they, when they get out there and when the word is spread and when the consciousness changes, that people can make an enormous difference for, for their countrymen, an enormous difference for the future of the world. I think this Brexit vote is going to absolutely uh, 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 rip – rip back the progress of globalism years, if not decades, within just a few years, because we see a resurgent uh, you know, civic nationalism in some places, uh, different types of nationalism in others. But nationalism is a huge step away from globalism, and nationalism and of, oftentimes uh, gives uh, communities and individuals the chance to have identity and to begin to um, – uh, to, to advocate, to advocate for the things that are important to them in their own community. So I think that, you, that a, lot of, uh, a lot of communities in Europe and here um, are really catching fire with this. I, I've seen Texas now say they want you know, to Texit. <laughs> and, uh, you know, honestly, who could blame them? Uh, you know, California is talking. Hey, he's like, hey, c c can we leave too? Uh, so, you're, you know, Ron Paul has talked about this before. He has said that secession – is going to return. Secession is a very um, you know, American ideal. I mean, you know, that's what that's why there is a U.S. because they seceded from Great Britain, and that idea was 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 shelved uh, in the 19th century. But it's coming back with a vengeance, and that's a great thing. So it's good for liberty. I also think that it's good for precious metals because there are so many. Uh, there, there there are. It's so entrenched, the system of, of finance and, and, and the monetary system around the world, as you well know, that when something like this uh, turns the tables, it throws uh, the, the controllers into a tizzy because, because the markets don't like – huge bouts of insecurity. They don't like huge surprises like this. And even people like, like Soros, who lost you know, $1.5 billion being long the Great British Pound right before the Brexit vote, even big players were somewhat caught off guard by this. So I think that the market rigging of gold and silver uh, has only been successful because there has not been a huge spark, a huge, you know, as they say, black swan. And this Brexit, which no one thought would be successful – was and I think that could be a huge black swan that causes them to slowly and then quickly lose control of the whole apparatus. Yeah, you brought up George Soros. I was actually going to bring him up too for a different reason. He actually made comments how he thinks that the UK leaving the European Union in the capacity means that the European Union will dissolve now. And we're starting to see to see stories about other European countries in the European Union saying, "Hey, now, well, if they can leave, we want to leave too." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. This and this is what I was hoping for. I was praying for a Brexit like every day, but I wasn't going to get my hopes up a after Greece tried heroically and failed to break free from Brussels and Berlin. After, you know, af after Cyprus was absolutely raped, raped by these people just to say, just to put a Band-Aid 
on this fake, phony, failing monetary, economic, cultural, and political experiment in the EU. So the fact that someone broke free first, all it takes is one. All it takes is the first heroic step of someone to succeed in seceding, <laughs> secede to succeed. Once they break free, freedom is contagious. It's extraordinarily contagious. And there are other ancient proud peoples all across Europe who are tired of joblessness, who are tired of constant invasion from other countries they have no control over, who are tired of, of, of the oligarchs and the planners at the top rigging a system against them for you know for these multinational corporations and banks that do not have their best interests at heart and and you're exactly right you know there's le pen in, in, in france in, in her party the national front uh you know there's a, a alternative for deutschland in germany which went from nothing to 28 percent of the vote in like three years it's one of the largest parties in germany you have a huge uh movements popping up in in, in finland in, in norway in um in all the all, all the, the the slavic countries you have uh hungary you know really going uh full force for it. and now italy's saying they want to leave so you're absolutely right i i think he's right but here's the danger and there is there is an unseen danger to this and it it it, it does pose a risk for europe and i want to address that real quick Someone leaked the plans for the real reason why the EU was concocted. They, they always wanted a, a, an, a European a megastate. They always wanted a superstate to politically control and cow all of the ancient proud peoples of Europe. That was the end goal. The hook, the lure was to say, hey, what if we had a common currency? You know that would that would help everyone out, but that 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 you, you you're laughing. Yeah, you you and I know that's not what it was about. That was the hook, and then once you're in, you know it's you know you you check out at the Roach. It's like the Roach Motel. You check out at the morgue. You know, there's no checking out of this 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 great nightmare called the EU. But somebody did check out. Now that's forcing the elite's hands to kind of ramp up. The ramp up the timetable to say, hey, well, um, you know, not only are we not going away, but we're going to consolidate everything and quickly into this European megastate. So it might force the hands of these people who've been playing this for several generations to, uh, to, to actually hasten, hasten the drive towards centralization. But if they do that, the tighter and quicker they grip these countries, the harder the countries will pull away from them. So I think this is the beginning of an epic struggle, a struggle for identity, a struggle for freedom, a struggle for future, a struggle for liberty for each uh, of the, the many ethnic peoples of, of uh, Europe. It's exciting. It's history turning on a dime. And, you know, hurrah for the, for the peoples of Britain. It took courage to do that. And I hope they can stand fast and, and, and finish with Article 50 soon and be out and inspire other Europeans and other peoples to do likewise. There's always a price for freedom. You know, it's sweat or blood or, you know, it's going to be a financial price if it's things like a painful divorce or things like that. But I'm noticing scare tactics now coming out of the mainstream media about other countries potentially leaving. You know, we've seen uh, we've seen news stories come out about England and Britain. Uh, the stuff that's coming out is, oh, well, here's the credit downgrades now, and you know yes. your currency's dropping. So there's financial warfare now. It looks like the elites, the globalists, the banksters, they they're doing this now to send warning shots to the other countries who would plan on leaving. Absolutely, you 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 hit it out of the park. That they, <laughs> within 72 hours of voting to leave the European Union, like magic, like whoosh. S&P steps in and says, oh, yeah, by the way, your credit rating is crap all along. We, we must have made a mistake. No, no. <laughs> that was pure blackmail. It is pure intimidation tactics. It is a financial declaration of war by, by, by the credit rating agencies, which are simply political tools of the banks and politicians, to swoop in and say, yeah, you didn't do what we wanted, so now we're going to downgrade your credit. We're going to downgrade your bonds. We're going to try to trigger some kind of uh, currency crisis, some kind of bond crisis with your country uh, to scare and shake up your people and, and cow 
other people who are wanting to do what you did. So you're absolutely right. That was that was a declaration of war on Britain and all European peoples. And it's proof. It is further proof that act of intimidation was proof that the EU is an abusive relationship that no free people should continue to assent to. Well, Watchman, those tens, 10,000 bureaucrats in Brussels who are making, you know, six figure salaries, they're not going to give up their jobs without a fight. They can't get fired. They, they don't have to produce any results. I mean, if you were making $600,000 a year to do nothing, I mean, you would probably not want to lose your job either. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. No, absolutely. You know, and Nigel Farage had a fantastic speech. Uh, uh, you know, on the floor of the EU Parliament in the last 24 hours, where he basically said uh, uh, almost exactly what you said. He looked at the whole lot of them and he said, uh, "We're going to have to behave like adults. We're going to have to come to some mutually beneficial trade agreements. It may not be what you want, but it will be helpful to you and to us. And I know that none of you have ever had a proper job in your life. <laughs> I know," <laughs> said, "I know that none of you have ever created a single job or done anything of note with your lives except this. But you're going to have to understand that it's for our mutual benefit if we continue to trade, and we can work out good trade deals. We can work out mutually beneficial trade deals, even though." We're going to do things our way, and you're going to do things your way. That's We'll continue to be your best friends. We want trade. We want friendship, but we want uh, to determine our own destiny. And so you you put, brought up a great point. These people are not going to take this line down, but uh, neither are, uh, are the peoples of Europe. The countries of Europe are rising up, and it, it's happening so fast that we're seeing years happen sometimes in days now. And very soon that, that, that will accelerate faster. You'll start to see decades happen in, in just a few days or a few weeks. So it's exciting. It's a little perilous as well, but it's, a, it's an exciting and interesting time to be alive. Yeah, and not to, to offer a little bit of a counter there, not every single person in England is in favor of Brexit. There's still lots of brainwashed people. I actually ran into a young married couple, young professionals who are here. Uh, I guess they had just moved for part of a business uh, opening up in the northern Virginia, Washington, D.C. area, and they were not in favor of Brexit, of leaving in the vote. They were really upset about it. Uh, I think, you know, there's a lot of millennials who were actually in the polling before it occurred who didn't want to leave. And then I guess they didn't show up to vote. And then one of them went and posted the Boris Johnson speech on Pornhub saying that he fucked 15. <laughs> he screwed over. Excuse me. He screwed over 15 million British people with the Brexit uh, decision. <laughs> no, no, that, that's outrageous. Um, look, I understand that there are mixed feelings. I do understand. L listen. If it, if it was me or you in, in an American state, in a state in the United States, voting to secede, uh, there would obviously be a lot of mixed opinions. Many people would be for it. Many people would want a new direction and a new birth of freedom. Others would be very scared. Uh, some of the young millennials and a lot of the uh, – the, the, probably the elder generation uh, who have been used to the same thing all their lives. They would be worried about their 401ks. They would be worried about their retirement. They would be worried that they're going to be cast out in the streets, that there will be no more social programs. They'd be worried about all the unknowns, and I understand – The currency attack too. Huh? The currency, the currency attack too yes. is probably the main one. Yes. yes. Look how quick the currency fell uh, immediately after it. Yeah, that was the currency attack. People were really scared about that. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. They attacked the currency and, and, and it is war but they're they're trying covert economic war right now instead of an invasion like they did like britain did with the uh the the colonies or, or the u.s government did with the south they're opting for a for a, a, a no less brutal but a, a more covert form of warfare economic warfare that's the kind of warfare that dc has been fighting against anyone it disagrees with for the last you know half a century and and so yeah there would be repercussions for an for a state in the U.S. to do what Britain did, and it would have economic repercussions uh, with the currency, uh, you know, and even risk invasion. I mean, look what look what D.C. did before. When so, if, I'll say this: the EU has been far more civilized when someone has tried to secede from their system so far than D.C. was when someone tried to secede from their system. Okay, you know, no one's talking about burning down London yet. 
No one's talking about you know b b you know blockading with warships the entire you know British Isles like they did in, in you know with the American South. So at least it, at least it has not gotten to that stage. But 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 Jason, who knows what what the future holds if they try to make Britain uh, you know the cause for the collapse, and they might they might trigger the collapse and say, yeah, you see, it was those nationalists. It was these selfish Britons who thought that they could be an island by themselves. They thought that, you know, that they could do their own thing and there wouldn't be repercussions for everyone. So now we all know that the real solution is more globalism so that this tragic catastrophe, this collapse can never happen again. I can see that happening. I can see that. Yeah. Happening. Or, or to add to your points there about stuff DC has done in the last uh, X number of decades, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, what John Perkins said. Now, obviously, like, I think he's kind of anti-free market and things like that. But, you know, the, there was a lot of fascism. There was global cartels and these large corporations combining and using the government crony capitalism and things like that to get government agencies to, to you know, replace uh, yes. Well, to to use military force or other means with jackals, economic hitmen, and things like that. So there was a lot of that in other countries. Yes. So the the U.S. has been involved in ridiculous politics for a very long time. Agreed. Now I want to transition to gold and silver, which is something mm -hmm. you specialize in. You just put out a video a couple of weeks ago about China accumulating lots of physical silver. Do you think then that they're running out of physical gold to buy? Why do you think then that they've transitioned to physical silver? That's a really great question. Um, one of the things that I'm watching is, is uh, as you are as well, the overall accumulation uh, by uh, by Beijing. Now, one of the things I, I want to say is that you know the official numbers say I think I think the official numbers say that uh, that the gold reserves of China are now I don't know what 1,800 tons or something, uh, 17, 1,800 tons. Okay, that's. I, is that is that correct? Uh, that's just the People's Bank of China. Right. That that doesn't that's, count any of their other way places they could stash that's exactly, it. Yeah, <laughs> that was exactly what I was getting to. Anyone who believes eighteen hundred tons, uh, you know, I, bring them to me because I've got yeah, you know, I've got some you know oceanfront property uh, in Colorado to sell them, um, and it's going to be a great deal for them. I assure you. Uh, no, it's it, they've got at least three times that much gold, and maybe five times that much gold, as you say, hidden in, in many places uh, all over China. Uh, you know, they, they may not be. It, it's simply a matter of a journal entry, or maybe moving a few bars from one warehouse to another. They have much more gold than that. But they've been slyly and stealthily accumulating and hiding their real – you know, you never reveal your true power level to your enemy until you're ready to take that enemy out. And that's what they've been doing for a long time with the Western banksters. They've been accumulating gold on the sly, and it, they've got much more than 1,800 tons, and Russia has much more than its – than it's you know than it's you know fifteen seventeen hundred tons whatever it is now they they they've got a great deal more than that as well but but he, here's here's why I think that they're starting to move into silver I think that whatever the real tonnage is behind the scenes they are starting to get to the point where they say well I think we've drained a lot of the city of London's gold I think we have gotten a lot of the core gold out of the way I think that Lo they th I think they think London is now moving gold starting to move gold hand to mouth just like they're doing with silver. I mean, there's been some huge imports recently of gold back into the city of London, and I think that those Im that those huge uh, one-time imports happened because they were actually getting very, very low on you know unencumbered bars to sell in large tonnage in large quantities to sovereign entities who wanted to buy it. And, and I think that. Uh, they're, if, you, if you've noticed, I want everyone to go back and check this. Go back and look at China's stacking for the last several months. Go back and look at Russia's stacking for the last several months. They've both officially, quote unquote, slowed their gold purchases quite a bit. In fact, uh, this last month, I believe, China, for the first time in like, you know, since they've been starting to regularly report, didn't report almost any new gold at all. And I think. Uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, central bank of Russia only reported like three tons, like three tons this last month. When they've been doing, you know, ten to twenty tons a month 
for the last two years. I don't know. I, I've got suspicions about why that is, but I also think that they think that the gold is, is, is scraping the bottom, and I think they're giving it time. They may be trying to see uh, the, the gold that's coming in, how the mechanics of that work, where it is. They may be trying to get a feel for how much is left, and so I think they may be slowing purchases a little bit while they are moving into other assets as well. And I think that's where silver comes in. I've been watching the silver build, uh, you know, in in Shanghai, but um, I've the the the, the imports. Uh, in the China of silver in the last six to nine months has been really, really staggering. And, and I think that it goes well beyond simply what they use and what they need for, you know, their solar industry or their electronics or their, you know, whatever. I think that big players who've, who've moved into Bitcoin in the past for some speculation, they've moved into this, they've moved into that. I think some of them are ready to start looking at silver. And I think they think the time is right for that. And I believe, and this is what I didn't get a chance to say in the video, I believe that, that, that Beijing has been preparing the, the Chinese people for the return of silver, and I believe they can use that silver card for vengeance anytime they want to. Truth be told, they have a whole deck full of vengeance cards. They can play the currency card, they can play the, 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 the U.S. bond card, and they, they can play any card they want. But I think that they are preparing to force the silver issue. But I don't think it's good. Here's the twist. Here's the twist to it all. I don't think Beijing is going to come out and may start making like huge silver purchases per se. I believe they are going to start aggressively um, seeding the idea of silver in their people's minds. I mean, they've got over a billion citizens. And so if they, for, if they encourage their peoples to force the issue, if they encourage their citizens to do it, which wouldn't be hard – then the issue can be forced and they wouldn't take the blame for it. Whoever moves into silver as a sovereign player overtly will bear the blame. The banksters will blame them for forcing some kind of collapse. So I, I think that they have to be sly about how they do it, but I think that that movement is absolutely underway and that chi the Chinese people are about to go nuts for silver in, in the months ahead. Yeah, so we have some anecdotal evidence from Jim Rickard speaking with his Swiss refiners that, you know, they're having trouble sourcing physical gold uh, and they're running their refinery. These are one of the largest couple refineries in Switzerland, gold refineries, and they're running the refinery 24-7, 365, and they're having trouble sourcing tonnage. Uh, we've heard from Rob Curvy, who specializes in uh, getting tonnage of gold. You know, these are not coins or bars you can buy at the shop. That's retail level. We're talking tons of gold. Uh, Rob Curvy says there's problems getting tonnage. Of physical gold so we know that uh the newmont mining ceo this is uh this is actual he's quoting studies he says his research uh from his company says that the annual gold mining production is going to be down seven percent total in 2016 and it may even be down in 2017 2018 why because there's a lot of companies that produce gold as a byproduct and the copper price has been crashing so i i think you know um with the supply, I think we're definitely, if we don't already have supply problems for physical gold and silver, I think on the supply side, you laid out how demand is strong. I'll say I'll take the supply side and I'll say there's looming supply problems because the, these base metal mines that produce gold and silver as a byproduct, these guys are in trouble. So we're seeing, uh, you know, studies coming out where there's going to be 13% drops in the uh, silver supply due to base metal mines shutting down. And then now we're going to see uh, gold, my, uh, gold byproduct uh, drop due to low base metal prices, too. Couldn't agree more with that. This, this, this would be the smart play for sovereigns going forward. As undervalued as gold and silver mining stocks are and mining companies are, and they are undervalued, the big pop in those companies over the last six months has made them – they're still a great value, but they're less of a value than they were in January. I mean you could buy, you could buy some of those countries for – the companies for well under uh, – you know, not just under earnings, but you could, you could get them for about the, the amount of cash they had in the bank. I mean they were going for pennies. Yep. But, but I think that you hit the nail on the head. I think that those who go and acquire quote-unquote base metal mining companies – can acquire gold and silver supply from those mines on the sly at an even cheaper price because that because the gold and silver in those mines is, is viewed as the icing on the cake and uh, incorrectly and not the cake itself. 
Um, and they would be viewed as the cake itself if the if the manipulation wasn't so overt. But you're right, and I think I, I you know I I used back in the last crash I owned a base metal mining company you know in Australia that 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 crashed that went to nothing. And China bought it, you know, and I was I, I and other investors were saved. We were saved from losing everything because China bought 90 percent of the mining projects of that one company. And and I know that they're doing the same thing in Africa. I've written the same thing about it. They're doing it in Zimbabwe right now. They're buying diamond mines. They're buying the platinum mines. They're buying uh, gold mines <clears throat> for, for very cheap. So that is the smart way that, that large players will accumulate gold going forward. Yeah, I think China is definitely looking at buying a lot of resource companies. I think they've taken out a lot of physical gold, uh, the stuff that was able to be sold. And I think, you know, now they're looking to go buy physical gold. Uh, I mean, they're looking to go buy mining companies to get access to gold. So they'll get some type of offtake agreements or things like that. They've done this with oil and other commodities in the past. Not not in large amounts, though, with gold and silver, though, yet. But uh, we've seen news stories. I saw a dollar collapse a couple of months ago. There was a story about how like one of the largest gold miners in China was getting backed by their banks to go out on a large buying spree all over the world to buy up more uh, gold mining assets. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, nothing else makes any sense right now. They've already got probably between five to ten thousand tons of gold, you know, right there. Russia probably has comparable numbers of go, you know tonnage of gold as well, and the only thing going forward that makes this sense is if they are reaching supply problems, what better way to take care of that and nip it in the bud than be the supply yourself? Yeah, and that makes sense why they would want to move over the uh, commodity exchanges and the gold and silver price fixing to China because they consume so many commodities. So it makes no sense to have London and New York and Chicago set the prices and you know use paper derivatives to manipulate the prices lower when China is the one who's buying all the commodities. Precisely. Uh, you know, 100, 200 years ago, you could say, you know, I, I'm still against the market rigging. Uh, in, in any form or fashion, but you could make a, a stronger case 100, 200 years ago that those that the main exchanges should have been in those places. Not anymore. They're not the players anymore. They don't have the actual product anymore, and they are losing influence because of that on the world scene. Now we're seeing the power, uh, the political power, uh, the, the pricing power, the economic power gravitate to those who have gravitated to gold. Those who have the gold make the rules. That's the golden rule that the world knows, and China and Russia and many other players in Eurasia going forward will have the gold, and they will be able to show their gold to the world, unlike many in the West who have big gold numbers on a piece of paper saying, look, we have 8,000 tons. we got more gold than you. They're going to say, show us. We've got auditors who would love to see your gold. We will come by and we will come with cameras and we will show the world your gold so that beyond a shadow of a doubt, you can prove your supremacy on this topic. And I believe they're going to have uh, – they're, they're going to be forced. They're going to be called out on it, and, and they're either going to put up or shut up. There's going to be a new day. There's going to be a new dawn. There's going to be a new sheriff, and it won't be the, the, the powers that were. Do you, do you think all these governments are trying uh, – they're basically trapped and these central banks and governments are trapped and uh, ultimately they're going to have to go back on some type of global gold standard or they're going to have to maybe raise the gold price higher to devalue the currencies to devalue the debt? That's a great question. I think that they would literally rather swallow cyanide capsules than go back to a fair, honest – productive monetary system, including gold and silver. I think every last one of them would do that. That's going to be the last thing that they do. But in the end, many of them will be forced to do this because the others who are not taking orders from them anymore are going to be doing that. And if they want to be competitive, if they want to survive, if they want to provide value, if they want to be approached by market, the market forces in our world, they'll have to be able to offer you know, real value in their currency. So in the end, I've long suspected that the rigging in gold and silver will continue until one of two things happen. Either the system comes unglued, and when everyone is really, really, really scared, they try to roll out some new kind of system that's probably not going to be much better, but they'll try. Or they will wait to the last minute and revalue gold, you know, three, five, ten times higher, whatever, and and – they will have that overnight stealth inflation priced in gold so that they don't have to string it out painfully over many years. 
And, uh, you know, that they will resort to that it is a last ditch effort. They will be dragged kicking and screaming into a world that's more fair for you, for me, and for our listeners. Yeah, plus they can fake the GDP and the uh, inflation numbers and the jobs numbers all the way until that. Although more people are waking up, a good amount of people still unfortunately believe that. Uh, Jim Rickards actually estimates that central banks have put over $30 trillion in currency swaps into the asset markets and global economy since 2008. So, I mean, I, I don't think any of this is sustainable. I don't know how much longer they can kick the can down the road. But, um, you know, I don't think they can put another 50, 60, 70 trillion into the system and keep this going for decades longer. No, I don't think so either. And I think I think the tell is going to be is going to be credit. The tell is going to be the bond market. The tell is going to be also uh, the, the energy market, because if if you don't have abundant, cheap energy, it doesn't matter what you know, how good your credit is, because the prices of everything is going to go up. If, if you do not have the energy to move your economy, to move your market. And I think that, uh, you know, what we're seeing in, in the Bakken fields, what we're seeing, you know, SRS, Rocco, Steve San Angelo, others, you know, uh, have done a really great job in reporting about this. You know, you know Shale, you know, ha, you know, it's done some good things, but it, it, at the same time, it, the, 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 the rate at which these wells expire is astronomically higher than normal wells. And the price of the price of energy, without you know this global cabal of of of, of oil riggers and everything, would just be it, it, that is wholly unsustainable. And that the, the unsustainable um, oil and energy um, conundrum, coupled with zero and even negative interest rates, uh, it, that is about to end. You cannot. You get without that cheap energy and without infinite cheap credit, this Ponzi goes up and smoke and it goes up immediately. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, I was I was waiting to hear if you would say that the Federal Reserve and Wall Street helped fuel that credit bubble because, you know, even at 90 or $100 oil, a lot of these shell companies still weren't making money. They were barely able to service their debts. So what that was telling me was even at high oil prices, this was uneconomic, yet they were getting almost unlimited financing for a while. So it was just head scratching. Precisely. No, it was totally Fed blowing bubbles, the BIS blowing bubbles, you know, the, 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 you know all the central banks of the West, uh, uh, you know, all trying to kick in, you know, control print at the same time. Uh, and now Japan has been doing it too, but that is ending. They are hitting that wall. They can't do much more. Now they, they can try to take rates to negative one, negative two, negative three percent, but that, you know, we know from economic studies that, that that once you reach that wall, you need exponentially more credit, exponentially more easing each time to get a shorter and shorter prop of the system. So as, as they try to, to extend and pretend longer, the, the consequences become more dire and dire, and the time, the bump of each intervention is less and less. It cannot be sustained for decades and decades. It might, it probably can't be sustained for even a few more years. It's going to come unglued and it's, it's sooner, much sooner rather than later. Yeah, it's the law of diminishing returns, which is an economic law uh, before Keynesian economics came along and tried to disprove that. And, you know, Keynes, we're getting to the euthanize the rentier when we have the negative interest rates and stuff like that. We have hardworking savers. People have tried to do the right thing all their lives and not overconsume and save money. Now, and they're retired. And now they don't have any uh, investments out there where they can comfortably live off the uh, interest rates. That's right. That is why Brexit happened. In a nutshell, what you just said. The, 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 the futures, the, the lifelong savings of our parents and grandparents and the futures of our kids have been burned in an unholy bonfire as a sacrifice to this soulless globalist experiment that is blowing up right now. And it, it, it's very telling that a lot of the people who didn't want Brexit, the key reason is, well, look at my 401k. Now, all they could see was the dollars and cents, not – well, I, we don't have any freedom or, you know, we've lost our country or, you know, we're being we're being dictated to by unelected people we've never met who don't care about us. It's always, well, you know, what's going to be the, you know, the, the, the dollar cost, the monetary cost. So it's, it's very different set of values. I do understand those concerns, but that's why Brexit happened. That's why these these movements will continue to gain steam going forward. 
yeah, the Federal Reserve, if you ask them if they've helped Main Street, Main Street, they would try to justify and say, oh, well, look at your housing prices are back up and your 401ks back up and the wealth effect work. That's the justification. And we know that's BS because the person on Main Street is being choked to death. They're having trouble finding a high paying full time job and, you know, inflation and taxes through this global fa this fascism right. and the cartels of the central banks and all these other global corporations in different industries forming cartels and bureaucrats and stuff are just you know destroying the real economy precisely well i have one precisely. well i have one more question for you before i let you go sure. uh, do you do you think we're going to have a stock market crash before the election or after the election <laughs> <laughs> that is the question isn't it you know um it, 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 these people, these controllers use these levers of power on Wall Street to pull – to tug at the emotional heartstrings of the average voter. Okay, They, they, they did it in Britain. Uh, they didn't do it – but they, they're doing most of it after the fact. Will they will they say, well, we should have crashed the pound before Brexit? You know, I mean, we, you know, will they say, well, we shouldn't make that mistake again? We're going to we're going to crash things. We're going to scare people. I don't know. I mean, the the timing last time, uh, the crash before, you know, in 2008, basically handed the White House to Obama. I, I believe he was behind in the polls until that happened, and then it was never looking back because because they looked and said, well, we don't want any more of this. We're going to try something different. Uh, and so I, I, it really depends. It really depends, Jason, how 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 much more bang for the buck they can get from the system, and if they think they can, uh, if crashing the system or crashing Wall Street uh, to a very discounted level would scare enough people into voting for more globalism, they might try it. But if it would have the opposite effect, and they 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 believe it would. They might try to wait and crash it afterwards and say a Trump administration and say, look, look what he did, you know, look, 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 you know, and, and, and use him as, as the pariah, you know, as, as the scapegoat. So it really I think it really depends on uh, the, the, what the, the controllers and because the, the, I think they see their whole system under threat now. And so if they can use the, this crash to scare more people toward a more centralized solution, they'll do that. Now, if they don't think that, that they get that solution by doing it before the election, then they probably won't. But they'll try, you know, hold it off and, you know, for a few more months. But if, if they think they can, they might. I think, I think it really comes down to that issue. Yeah, I mean, timing of these things is almost impossible, exact timing. So, I mean, I was just, I was basically just asking you if you think a crash is in the near future. But uh, it, you brought up an interesting point there. I mean, what the old political saying, and like, I, I guess it's been derived from Machiavelli, but I think like Rahm Emanuel, who was like Obama's chief of staff, said, never let a good crisis go to waste. Absolutely. No, absolutely. And the question is, when, the, when will the crisis happening be most beneficial to them? Okay, and they, they're very aware of this right now. They're on the ropes right now. They're losing the hearts and minds in Europe, and they're losing hearts and minds here in the States. So they have to be careful. They have to be careful about how this goes down and when, or they lose more. So I know that sounds like a non-answer, but it actually – I think everything hinges on that. I think everything hinges on what they – how they can maximize it, and as you say, uh, according to Rahm Emanuel, how they can make the most of that crisis. Yeah, I've talked with a lot of other experts besides yourself. I think the next six to 12 months, there's probably going to be another stock market crash. I don't know if they'll let it go for a long time before the next quantitative easing program, but the Federal Reserve is responsible for about 90% of the stock market rise since 2008. Yes. There's been correlations on this. There's been academic studies. Yes. I think Michael Maloney even did a video about Brexit too, showing the Federal Reserve's own numbers with the money supply increase and the stock market increase of the base money supply growing since uh, 2008. Yes, entirely artificial, entirely central bank created, and we are definitely, by all metrics, overdue for a face-ripping crash uh, of valuations. I mean, the PE ratios, everything historically, it's nuts. I mean, there's no, there's, there is, you can find value. You're a value investor. You're good at it, but it's hard. It's very hard right now on in mainstream investments to find value because everything is overvalued. 
Exactly, exactly. The, the, the currency is being given out, these currency swaps and yen carry trade and all these things. They've caused, you know, art prices to rise, bond prices to rise, real estate, stocks, pretty much everything has gone up. You know, even that's fueling some of the speculations, even fueling things like Bitcoin and stuff, especially with currency devaluations. You brought up uh, China's demand for Bitcoin. Well, part of that is the RMB has been drastically devalued first against the euro and the Japanese yen, and then against the dollar, there was Chinese savers who weren't just going to take the devaluation. They went into gold and silver and Bitcoin, uh, you know, trying to get their money out of the RMB before it devalued any further. No, you're right. I was one of the people who bought a few Bitcoin about three or four months ago because I said, I think there's going to be another Chinese intervention. I think they're going to devalue the yuan, and I think millions of Chinese are going to go, well, I, we, I can't hold that in my mattress anymore. Where am I going to go? So I so I, I said I think they're going to buy some Bitcoin and they, and they have, but you're right that they were reacting to bad central policies and that's what's driving a lot of this of this speculation in, in these markets. So just to just to really wrap up for your listeners, I think that we're overdue for a crash, but whenever it happens, do not be afraid. Look at Europe. Look at Brexit. Look at all the minds being changed right now. They know that globalism is a failure, an abject failure, a, a, a soulless, heartless, and cruel system that only benefits those at the top who rigged it and created it in the first place. It does not benefit you and, you and I. But – you and I are having more influence than ever through our shows and through uh, you know just the consciousness of the West that is changing right now. It is exciting, and, it, and it's a reminder that if you bring the fight to them, if you refuse to say I am pitiful, you can be powerful. You can take. You can do what you can do, and that's a lot. You can help change the minds of your friends and family, or at least tell them what's going on. You plant those seeds, and over time, when they see things happening, they will say you were right. And that is what's happening everywhere. It's, it should be a great a rallying point for us, this Brexit. It is history changing. That's a history changing uh, uh, a point in time, and we are alive to watch it. it, it it's, it's remarkable. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, this uh, Independence Day. Well, uh, I mean, there's still a lot of bureaucrats and lawyers involved, and I know how lawyers work, so I mean, they're going to be fighting this. I think they said it'll take two or three years yes. for England to leave, even uh, so it's going to be a long time before they get out, even after this vote. Yes, but nevertheless, nevertheless, that was a sea change, and people, the, 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 they can see the writing on the wall. They're whistling past the graveyard. The controllers are whistling past the graveyard. The future is not them. It's you and I. It is normal, everyday, plain, decent people who just want freedom and a better life for themselves, their families, and their peoples. Yep, and we would, we don't want our savings destroyed by you know con constant currency devaluations because uh, these people in power, the central bankers and other talking heads, tell us it's good for the economy when we know otherwise. Absolutely. Okay, Watchman. Well, I, I really enjoyed this. If our listeners want to find your work, how do how do they do so? Yes, a great question. Um, my website is thewealthwatchman.com. I, I I put material there, fresh material each week. Uh, I, I do you, uh, uh, videos for my YouTube channel, uh, uh, the Wealth Watchman YouTube channel, as well as um, uh, original content myself. And uh, you know, if you can sign up for free, you can become an email subscriber. You can sign up on social media to follow me. Uh, and Jason, keep up the great work. Thanks for having me back. Keep bringing the fight to them. Keep up with your excellent content. It's making a difference, and, and, and people are taking notice. Yeah, thank you, buddy. Uh, we just passed 10,000 subscribers. I thought it, I thought it would happen a lot sooner, but uh, you know, I'm just gonna keep grinding it out. Richly deserved. You deserve it.